Hey, I'm Pastor Rod. Thanks for joining us today. I hope this message makes a difference for you. I don't like being late. Ever. To anything. I was raised in a family where on time was late. So being late wasn't an option. We were always early. To church, everywhere else. Because of how I was raised, I think being late sends a message. Being late says, I I was doing something more important, or I'm too busy for you, I'm too busy for this. This is so far down my priority scale that being on time doesn't matter. I'm important, everyone should wait on me. I understand a lot of people have good excuses why they're late. Sometimes things happen that are out of your control. Your kid throws up on the way to the car, there's an accident on the highway, There's a snowstorm or more recently a flood. Your car won't start. Those are decent excuses. Let me tell you what's not a good excuse. We're just always late. We've always been that way. We can't help it. Really? If I offer you a free trip to Hawaii, but you have to be at the airport at 1 o'clock, and if you're one minute late, we'll leave without you. You're going to be late. You're going to miss the free trip to Hawaii. No, you'd be on time because it matters to you. Maybe you've heard some of these lame excuses. I'm just slow in the mornings. I hit every stoplight. My cat was sick. You shouldn't have a cat in the first place. I had to stop and get gas. In other words, my lack of planning yesterday is why I'm late today. I stayed up all night playing video games. There was a long line at Starbucks. This next one I actually got in a staff meeting one morning. McDonald's was out of sweet tea, and I had to go to the other McDonald's. (laughs) My phone died, and I didn't know what time it was. I had a pickle on my sandwich and had to go back to Chick-fil-A. Okay, that's not lame. That is completely acceptable if that happens. (laughs) My alarm didn't go off. I hate that excuse. What that usually means is I hit snooze when my alarm went off, and then I hit snooze again and again. I don't like to get out of bed. Well, if that's your excuse, you should try one of these alarm clocks. Sometimes it's just whatever it takes. Now, if you have trouble waking up in the morning, I have for you a gift. This is an official alarm clock from our time change video. So this is the genuine article right here, which has got to make it, and it just keeps making noise. It's got to make it worth double. So who would like an alarm clock today? Does he need it? All right, come here. I'll give you an alarm clock. And if, the, if he doesn't wake up to this, get the hose, turn it on him. She said, we've done that. As much as I hate being late, sometimes it happens to me. It, when my schedule is tight, if one appointment or meeting goes long, or if one person is late, it affects the entire day. And it affects my mood. I feel like a slacker when I'm late. I have a doctor I go to once a year. Every time I go, he's running 45 minutes to an hour late. Every time. That's not a crisis. That's a strategy. So I tried booking the first appointment of the day. No difference. I was the first patient and still waited 45 minutes. That makes me crazy. Sometimes when I'm speaking somewhere, 
when the meeting's supposed to start, we're still in the hospitality room or in the pastor's office. And I ask, isn't it time to start? They say, oh, we don't start on time because the people aren't here on time. We'll start in a few minutes. I want to say, have you ever thought maybe the reason the people aren't here on time is because they know you're not going to start on time? You might have noticed we have a big clock on the balcony wall. We don't just start on time. We start on time to the second. Why? Because what we're doing matters. The Super Bowl starts on time because they think football is important. What we're doing is far more important. People's lives are at stake. When something's important, you start on time. Uh, Just as an aside, while we're talking about being late, some of you are late to church, not just once in a while, but every week. I don't get that. Do you plan on being late? Is that your strategy? Okay, I'll go on. Um, I think I've established I don't like late. I can't always control it, but when someone or something is late, I'm frustrated. Have you ever felt like God was late? You have a big need, you have a crisis, something needs to happen right now, but it doesn't? Or you have a promise from God and you wonder, God, what are you doing? Are you seeing what's happening? I'm going under, I'm not going to make it, we're not going to survive. You better do something right now. Maybe you've prayed, God, I need a miracle, and I need it now. I'm trying to be patient, but this really needs to happen today. I've prayed that way. I guess I want God to announce to all heaven, hey, everyone stop what you're doing. Rod says he'd like his miracle right now. So forget about everything else. Forget about everyone else. Let's make sure we take care of Rod's need on Rod's timetable, because after all, Rod knows what he needs and when he needs it better than I do. Now, when I say it that way, it sounds foolish, doesn't it? Obviously, your need doesn't take God by surprise. God, who knows everything, not only knows what you need, he knows when it should happen. You can't dictate pace to God. You can't make God do what you want on your schedule or your timetable even though you'd really like to. In my experience, this is why a lot of people quit on God. If God's a loving God, how could this go on so long? How could he just sit by and let this happen? Why doesn't he do something? Have you ever been there? You might be there right now. You've got a big need and you need an answer today. Time is running out. Something has to happen. I want to look at a story from the book of Luke, chapter 7, where hope was gone. It was too late, even for Jesus. Starting with verse 11, soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain. His disciples and a large crowd went along with him. Nain was a small village in a mountainous region of Galilee. On both sides of the steep road entering the village were rocky foothills dotted with caves that were used to bury the dead. Everyone had to pass through this cemetery in order to get into town. As Jesus approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. Jesus and his disciples were walking down the steep hill through the cemetery to the town gate. As they approached, a funeral procession was moving up the hill in the opposite direction. Middle Eastern funerals were, still are, different than we're accustomed to. They don't have a hearse. Later in this passage, the word coffin is used. That's the closest word the translators could find, but it was not really a coffin. Instead, the body was carried through the streets to the burial place on what was called a funeral bier, not B-E-E-R, but B-I-E-R. Picture a, a cot with handles. It was a loud, emotional scene. A dead person was being carried out. 
the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. It was a horrible loss. This mom was grieving the loss of her only son, but her problems were just beginning. In order to fully understand the gravity of her situation, you need to understand a little more of the customs of the day. At the death of the husband, it became the responsibility of the son to provide and care for his mother. Her son was her only means of financial support. Now she had years to live with no plan for survival or support. She couldn't go out and get a job. Women didn't work in those days. She was destined to a life of begging, barely getting by at best. When her son died, she might as well have died too. She's a tragic picture of a person with no hope. No doubt she prayed for her son to be healed, but it didn't happen. Now her son was dead, too late. A large crowd from the town was with her. Years ago, people had great respect for funeral processions. Remember, cars pulled over to the side of the road. Everyone stopped to show sympathy and honor to the family. Now you're lucky if people even slow down. Uh, a while back, I was in the funeral procession. I was following the hearse. So the hearse, then me, and somebody cut in between me and the hearse. I blessed them in Jesus' name. <laughs> but in those days, the town stopped. All attention was focused on this mom and her loss. The mother was at the front of the crowd. Those carrying the coffin were directly behind her. Behind the coffin were the mourners, friends and family. And then the people of the city joined the rear of the funeral procession, mourning with the mother and showing respect for the dead. People are often touched by someone else's tragedy. This woman wasn't alone. The tragic death of her son drew a large crowd. She was surrounded by neighbors, friends, even strangers who were mourning with her. Although it was comforting to have a big crowd of mourners, that didn't change her situation. There were a lot of people around her, but there was no one who could take the place of her son and provide for her. You can be surrounded by people, even helpful, sympathetic people, but often friends, doctors, financial experts don't have the answer. You can be surrounded by people, but still feel hopelessly alone. In those moments, what do you do? Where do you turn? Verse 13 starts with these five words, when the Lord saw her. In the middle of all the people and all the emotion, Jesus saw the woman. This is the turning point of the story. If this were a movie, the music would change. When you read that Jesus saw her, you know something's about to happen. Jesus sees you. Even at your worst moment, Jesus sees you. Jesus sees beneath the surface to the hurt and to the need. When you feel all alone, where you don't, when you don't know where to turn, when you feel like no one understands, when your situation is hopeless, even when it feels like it's too late and too far gone, Jesus sees you. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Jesus felt her pain and sensed her despair. He was moved by her desperation. Jesus knows your emotions, your doubts, your fears. His heart goes out to you. Jesus sympathizes with your pain. That's encouraging. But the second part of this verse seems really insensitive. Jesus said, don't cry. I mean, she lost her husband and now her son. She's got a good reason to cry. And Jesus says, don't do it. Don't cry. Now, if someone else said that, you'd punch them. But there was something different when Jesus said it. Jesus wasn't trying to avoid emotion. He wasn't uncomfortable with her mourning. When Jesus said, don't cry, something else was coming because he alone had the ability to change the situation she was crying about. It's good to have people cry with you. It, it can feel really good, but it's greater to know Jesus who can change the situation you're crying about. And then Jesus went up, touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. Jesus did the unthinkable. He touched the coffin. 
It was the ultimate violation of what's proper and right. This is like if you're the person whose phone rings during the most serious part of the church service and your ring is the Aflac duck. <laughs> That's actually happened. This is as, as inappropriate as an air horn at a ballet or wearing bright pink to a funeral. This is like wearing a beach outfit to the Christmas service to sing in a quartet with three other guys who are wearing Christmas sweaters. I mean, this is as inappropriate as cheering when the opponent fails at a gymnastics meet. I actually did that. I'd never been to a gymnastics meet before, and I, I went to watch and cheer for Lauren James. I wanted her to win. And in my sports mind, her winning means someone else loses. So when the enemy, I mean that, the other sweet little girl, <laughs> when she fell off the balance beam, everyone gasped except for me. I cheered. <laughs> Not knowing that her mother was sitting right in front of me. Not a good move. Everyone stared at me like I, I was an idiot. Don't you know you don't do that at gymnastic meets? We're for everyone. Well, that's the kind of moment it was when Jesus reached out and touched the coffin. You didn't do that for any reason, ever. If you touched the coffin, you were considered unclean. And you couldn't return to church until you went through this elaborate cleansing ritual that took seven days. Jesus knew that. He knew the rules. But he touched the coffin anyway because he had an agenda. When Jesus touched the coffin, everything and everyone stopped. The funeral procession quit moving. The mourners grew quiet. The pallbearers took a break. There's no doubt they'd heard stories about Jesus. He was a great teacher who performed miracles, but Jesus violated tradition and rules and customs. So the people stopped in shock when he touched the coffin. Maybe your situation has been going on a long time. Your prayers haven't been answered. You can't remember the last time you expected something good to happen. Over a period of time, you lose all belief your situation can change. But when Jesus comes on the scene, everything else stops. Then he went up, touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. Jesus said, young man, I say to you, get up. It was too late for conversation with the dead man. But Jesus told him to get up. The people in the funeral procession had to be wondering, what in the world? How can he give this woman false hope? How rude, how insensitive, what a horrible thing to do. But what happened next was absolutely incredible. The dead man sat up and began to talk. I wish I was there. Think about it. As they're walking through the streets along to the burial place, Jesus interrupted the procession. He touched the coffin. He told the guy to get up. And there in the middle of the street, surrounded by people, remember, he's being carried on the stretcher on the shoulders of guys. And all of a sudden, they feel some, the weight changing on the stretcher. And the dead guy sat up and started talking. And, and I'm a little frustrated at this point of the story because I want to know, what did he say? Was it, boo? I, I mean, what did he do? <laughs> did he thank Jesus? Did he say, what am I doing here? Did he say, why are you people crying? Did he start singing a song? What did he do? We don't know. But regardless, the boy who was dead was now alive. Funeral over. A large crowd, almost an entire town, witnessed Jesus raise someone from the dead. This story was never disputed. There were far too many witnesses. The dead man sat up and began to talk. Jesus gave him back to his mother. And what a beautiful picture. Jesus turned to the mother and said, Here he is. Here's your son. Can you imagine? The mother's tears of sorrow turned into tears of joy. This was better than any long-lost relative reunion. 
And once again, the Bible leaves out the details. I want to know what the moment was like. I want to know what the mom said to her son. I want to know the reaction. Because the details are left out, we tend to downplay the emotion. But come on, her son wasn't dead. Her son was alive. What would your emotion be? There is no way to accurately describe how that mom must have felt. I think she was dancing and shouting and hugging Jesus and hugging her son. The funeral was interrupted. The funeral bear was thrown to the side. The grave was left empty because in place of death, there was life. In place of hopelessness, there was joy. Grief turned to rejoicing. Sorrow turned to shouting. Tears turned to dancing. And then that mom let go of her son and grabbed Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How can I ever thank you enough? Thank you for giving my son back to me. Thank you for stopping the funeral and turning it into a celebration. Thank you, Jesus. Looked too late. Looked like life was over, but she got everything back. Jesus gave it all to her. Her son, her future, her hope, her joy. Maybe your situation looks too far gone. The funeral procession is close to the tomb. You think, there's, there's no way Jesus can help me now. You're financially ruined. With every trip to the mailbox or look at your account, you hear another clot of dirt hit the coffin, you know it's over. Your addict son or daughter has been in and out of rehab in jail. Your loved ones who once surrounded you in support now seem more like a crowd of mourners. Even your closest friends have given up. You're trying to have a child and just had another negative pregnancy attest. Your dream is dying. Maybe you've been fighting depression for so long that you don't remember what it is to feel better. Or you're sending money back to your family in your home country, but you're not sure you're ever going to be able to see them again. You've tried everything. There's no answer to the sickness. Even the doctors have given up. You hoped and hoped you'd meet that special someone. You refused to give up even though you made mistakes along the way and now it's looking like you'll never meet that person. Maybe your marriage is over. You worked hard to save it. But now it's obvious your efforts were in vain. You failed again. Feels like all you do is mess up. You're alone. No friends, no help, no hope. You love God, but it seems like he's let you down. Maybe you've even given up praying. There's no point. It's over. It's gone. There's nothing. It's too late. I've got good news for you. Jesus is not bound by the laws of nature, time, or space. What looks dead, gone, over and done can still be changed by Jesus. Jesus can restore everything you've lost. It is never too late for Jesus. And now here's the end of the story. Even though it's understated, we get a quick glimpse of the crowd's reaction. And they were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. The people were amazed. Then a worship service broke out. There was singing and dancing, a shouting, a celebration. The funeral procession became a victory parade back into town. Can you imagine the people who didn't attend the funeral? They stood at quiet attention by their store when the procession passed by towards the cemetery. They heard the weeping and the wailing. They saw the desperation and the grief. But the short time later, they heard a, a different sound. Shouting and laughter and singing and rejoicing. The same people were running back towards town and the dead guy was leading the parade. It was an unforgettable day in Nain. Verse 17 says, This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. You better believe it did. That's not the kind of story that stays in one place. You can't keep that to yourself. Word spread. Everyone heard about the funeral that wasn't. The widow, her son, the mourners told everyone what Jesus had done. This is such an important point. 
The purpose for God's power in your life, the purpose for him setting you free, is to focus attention on God. It's not for you to get the glory. It's for God to get the glory. People will see what God has done in your life and believe that they can also receive his help. Share what Jesus has done for you. When you've received an amazing miracle, you just have to share.